After round one of the 2023 NFL draft, there was some concern from some Packer fans about the first round pick, Lucas Van Ness. But then on day two, it was all pass catchers all the time for the Green Bay Packers doubling up at tight end. We break it all down on our live show immediately after day two of the NFL draft. You are Locked On Packers, your daily Green Bay Packers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap. A newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, at Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. The number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened. They want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. Today's episode brought to you by friends at Ultimate Football GM. Locked on Packers listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when you use the promo code Locked On in the game store. The Packers have altered in a fundamental way the trajectory of this football team. And they did it on day two of the draft after they go pass rusher in the first round. Lucas Van Ness, we talked about that on yesterday's show. Uh, we had some issues, by the way, getting the audio uploaded. It should be in your feed now. We also have some clips from little interviews that I did on the network that are also in your feed. If you're wondering what are these shorter snippets, the full episode is in your feed. Please go check that out. That was from our live show after round one, also on YouTube. Then on day two, with... A slew of options on the table. The Packers take Luke Musgrave, the tight end from Oregon State. And this was something that I talked about on the Gold Zone, um, a, a podcast over with, with Jacob Westendorf and Jake Morley, my buddies over on uh, Game On Wisconsin. And he might have the most physical tool upside at the tight end position in this draft. I think Dalton Kincaid, feel-wise, receiving tools, all that stuff, he was the guy that I felt like had the most pure upside. But in terms of physical ability, just what is in his body at 6'6", 250-plus, he was moving 20-plus miles an hour at the Senior Bowl when he opens it all the way up. That At 255, that is bananas. In fact, his athletic profile, is very, very, very similar to Travis Kelsey's. 461 in the 40. He is a former skier, comes from a family of skiers, a multi sport athlete in high school. This is your move tight end. He, his acceleration, his movement skills are really special. And I didn't, at 42, I had him more like in the 50s. I'm not going to quibble because Sam Laporta comes off the board. Detroit takes Sam Laporta ahead of Michael Mayer. The Raiders grab Michael Mayer. And so then you're going, now there's this clear next tier of players. And Darnell Washington, clearly there is issues there, knee issues. Um, there's character and attitude issues there. Some red flags that we've been talking about on this show. I, I told you, look, I don't know if he's going to get cleared by a lot of these teams. There's been reporting now that some teams just took him off their board for one reason or another. They're able to get Musgrave who can come in and do, you know, a lot of the things you wanted big Bob Tunyon to do from the slot. He is your true move tight end. Not, not a great blocker. Someone who is a, a, an effort blocker, but certainly has the body to do it. Here's the thing. Um, he has not played a lot. He just hasn't played a lot. 300 snaps in 2021. Now, in the, the few games that he did play last year in 2022, he was the Oregon State passing game. And I think that that gives you a little glimpse on what he can be. 
but there's still a lot that you want to um, develop here. His catch radius is crazy. For a 6'6 guy to be able to go down and get the ball, go up, go outside his frame. He's a strong runner after the catch. Um, and I think that you're going to want to scheme him up, but you can because of the way that he moves. His ball tracking, his ball skills, he is that prototypical move tight end. Here is the uh, the, the write-up that it at the end. Musgrave is the prototype in terms of size. Enormous long arm and broad shoulders. But it doesn't translate well enough in his blocking right now, and I worry about the lateral agility issues. He'll never be a guy that you want on the end of the line of scrimmage in six-man protections. That is true. He's not going to just go win versus a safety or a linebacker snapping off a route while some other guys in this class can. That said, size and build-up speed play. He can threaten the seam, make adversity plays, and win in the red zone. He's a very useful player who can be a CJ Uzama type in the NFL. I think that's the low end of what he can be. Um, I had an early third, late second round grade on him ultimately was in the 50s, as I said, in terms of what I thought he was as a player. But they weren't done. They weren't done. We're gonna get to I want to get to Jane Reed. They then in the third round get a player that I liked almost as much, Tucker Kraft, who is your true wide tight end. Both of these guys have bananas relative athletic scores, well over nine for both of them. Tucker Craft is your blocker. He is your true why. He's a little, a little uh, high sometimes as a blocker, but had an elite run blocking grade for pro football focus. He can make a catch and take a shot. Um, he's got really soft hands. He is the blocker. And look, I said, Kraft is a nice player. He's big. He flashes physicality as a blocker and a runner. He's not going to threaten teams vertically the same sort of way, but he's still young enough to develop some polish and with that frame, every, every team wants a tight end this size. Now, at the end of it, I said there's not that much to get excited about, but he's a nice player. I added the addendum that because he tested so well at the combine, I have to go back to the tape. And you go back to the tape and you go, oh, they used him on a, on a wide jet. They gave him an opportunity to go make a play with a ball in his hands. And you see him running down the seam a little bit more. And you start to go, okay, no, there's something here. There's, there's actually some, some juice here that maybe you didn't initially notice, or at least that I didn't initially notice. So now you have, we talked about the, the everydayers will remember, the combination of receiver and tight end. We didn't really talk about tight end and tight end, but this is exactly the kind of circumstances you want. And I don't think the Packers were said, okay, we got the move tight end. And so let's go get the blocking tight end. I don't think, I don't think they did that. Maybe that played into it. But the fact that you got two elite athletes, take elite athletes at tight end, nothing else matters. Remember what Kevin Cole said earlier this week. Take elite athletes and especially that 10 yard split. Well, guess who has an ultra elite 10 yard split? Luke Musgrave, a one five one. 10 yard split is hauling absolute, get the kids out of the room, hauling absolute ass. That is a big boy who can really move. And here's the thing. And we're, I want to talk about scheme with Matt LaFleur and all this stuff. In this offense, I understand what Travis Kelsey is. That is not what you need your tight end to be in this offense. George Kittle is not some like Antonio Brown, Devontae Adams level route runner. He's big, he's physical, and he is fast. And the scheme does most of the rest. And he's got great body control, great ball skills. He can make adversity plays. I'm not saying either of these guys are going to be George Kittle, but what I'm saying is the scheme can do a lot of the work. The problem that the Packers had over the last few years is they didn't have guys who could do both. Mercedes Lewis can block. He can block like a madman, but you can't run leak with him. Not really, and not create a chunk play with it. 
And Big Bob Tunyon has some nice movement skills, although they they waned the last two years. The ACL injury certainly did not help. But he's not going to create for you. Not really. doesn't have really the speed to create after the catch. And so you're not really going to run those little, you know, play action slide routes, get it to Tunyon and expect him to go make a play. You can do that with Musgrave. You can do that with Kraft. If you give them a little bit of space, they both have the buildup speed to create. And both of them, Musgrave certainly more than Kraft, can threaten vertically. Just give them a release down the middle of the field. If teams want to play too high, and a lot of teams like to play the Packers too high, I think we're going to see more single high against Jordan Love. But if they're going to play too high, here comes a safety down the middle of the field that you need a linebacker that's going to carry. You need safeties that have to be able to run with and then go make a play in a contested catch situation. And now you have a guy 6'6", 255, who ran 20 plus miles an hour at the Senior Bowl. I cannot emphasize to you enough how bonkers that is. These guys are elite athletes. Think of some of, just, just think of some of the tight ends that the Packers have had over the last couple of years. The athletes. Like Richard Rodgers. They, they converted James Looney, a defensive lineman, to tight end because things were so bad in the tight end room. Now they have two guys who could come in and be starter caliber players for you. That is incredibly, incredibly valuable. And I love that Brian Gudikins referenced his first draft with Ron Wolf When they went corner, 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 Antoine Edwards, Joey Thomas, and Mike McKenzie. And Mike McKenzie turned into the best of the group. I understand both these guys have injury issues. But if you get a Mike McKenzie level player out of one of these guys, you, that's a really good player. Mike McKenzie was a really good, really important player for the Packers for a very long time. Two bites at the apple. At, at least you hope one of these guys can hit. It is it is a strategy that I fully endorse when it comes to the tight end position. I understand 42 a little rich for some people, but my my position for a long time was third round, fourth round, fifth round. This is where you take the elite athletes. And anytime before that, you better be taking an elite athlete. Well, Luke Musgrave is that kind of S tier. Size, speed, athlete. And whether he's ready to come in right away and play, he doesn't really have a choice. These guys got to play. And so it's going to be up to Mountain LaFleur to figure out how this all fits together. We are going to talk more about that in just a second. But before we get there, today's episode brought to you by our friends at Ultimate Football GM. In fact, all of our draft coverage is brought to you by the Ultimate Football GM. If you think you could do a better job than Brian Gudikins, first of all, prove it. But now you can. Now you can prove it. Ultimate Football GM. M, hiring the right coaches and coordinators, managing all the finances, including negotiating player salaries and terms, navigating your franchise through free agency, through the draft, through player personnel issues, and all the ups and downs of a season. Ultimate Football GM is free and playable offline. Play on the go, play on an airplane, play on the subway. Locked on Packers listeners getting 100% free boost to their franchise when they use the promo code Locked On in the game store. That's Locked On, so make sure to check it out today. Download the game. Just visit ultimate Dash gm.com to look it up in the app store that's ultimate-gm.com ultimate football gm start your dynasty today so in between the tight end picks the packers drafted jaden reed and they and they didn't just draft jaden reed from michigan state they drafted jaden reed over guys like jalen hyatt who by multiple reports including some things that i was told the Packers really, really liked that. I don't know if that turned out to be a smoke screen or what. Or they just like Jaden Reed better. I guess. Certainly a different type of player. I will be honest. When this draft pick was made, I was underwhelmed. Because he was small. He is small. He still exists. At 5'11", 191. Small. And that is the smallest receiver that the Packers have drafted basically since Randall Cobb. And it's, you know, he's just a little short. 5'11", he's 5'10 and change. 191 is just a little light. 
He ran in the four fours. John Eric Sullivan in the Packers front office uh, staff said they had him at four three seven. So that would really be moving. I don't know if he's really four threes fast. And I I posted a tweet about some things that I had in my notes. They were not. It was not a glowing review. I had to say. And then I I went back and realized after I I saw a lot of people that were like, oh, I love the pick. But a lot of people, Todd McShay, love the pick, love the player. Uh, Matt Harmon, who has this thing called reception perception, where he he basically grades out every route and sees where do, where do these guys win, how do they win, man coverage, zone coverage, wh- what routes. Re- reception perception, which is a tongue twister, love the player. And so I'm like, man, am I missing something here? And I went back to my notes and I realized I never finished the report because he was small. And so I just watched one game. I watched the Michigan game. I watched him against DJ Turner, who ultimately um, does get drafted, goes to the Bengals. And I was just sort of like, well, he's small. And he didn't play great in that Michigan game. It was his worst graded PFF grade um, of the year. And so I just sort of like, I don't think they're going to draft him. So I'm not going to finish the thing. I have a lot of players that I needed to watch. So I went back. I did not, I did not give up. I went back and watched. And I, while I do not take anything back that I wrote in those notes originally, because I wrote them, they were true when I said them. What, what were the things that I said? Well, I said, struggle to separate from speedy Michigan corners, not much of a blocker, not explosive in and out of breaks. And for a 4-4 guy, he doesn't look as fast because he doesn't change speeds well in his routes. All of that, after watching, I think, five games of his in addition to the Michigan game, all still true. All still true. He doesn't block. He doesn't. He's going to play slot only for you. He is not the kind of smaller receiver who is going to snap off routes right now. He is not going to just put his foot in the ground and break off a receiver when when he's stemming his routes. When he gets to the top, he's not just going to hit the hit the Iverson crossover and create separation. It's just not what he does. And that's okay, but it's just not what he does. He actually has more twitch and and lateral mobility when he has the ball in his hand than when he's running routes. And maybe there's there's more untapped potential there. And that is one thing I added here. Now, two things that are really important to me about Jaden Reed. Everydayers know when it comes to receivers, there are two metrics I really care about. The dominator rating, which measures market share, how much of my team's offense am I generating? How many passing yards? How many catches? How many touchdown passes? How many first downs? 73rd percentile dominator, well above average for Jaden Reed. Okay, check that off the list. Breakout age. This is a measure of upside. Now, he just turned 23. In fact, turned turned 23 today, April 28th. It's now April 29th. 98th percentile breakout age. He was a young man playing really well at a big-time program. That's really good. Had a 1,000-yard season in 2021. Um, almost got there in 2022, 11th in deep catches. He was elite as a contested catch player, even at 5'11", uh, 191, almost 65% of his contested catches he converted. That is awesome. But just an average man coverage grade by pro football focus, his acceleration and deacceleration are really good. He just glides and then can slap on the brakes. Not going to get in and out of Lateral cuts, but on stop routes, comebacks, those kinds of things, that's where you see it. He's got really good body control. You love a receiver who returns punts because that means the coaches trust him. The ball skills are plus. Plus, plus, plus ball skills, body control, contested catch along the sidelines. He he won the game against Wisconsin on a fade route, and he can win vertically. If you're going to take a slot-only player, he better be able to win vertically and Jaden Reed can. The thing that I think the Packers are envisioning here is having a different type of player than they already have. Christian Watson, big, strong, fast. Romeo Dobbs, big, strong, fast. You get Jaden Reed, little, quick, fast. And that's the idea. And he can win at the catch point. He can go and you would hope he can go and just get you a bucket from the slot, free release. Go win. 
He has, he has some juice after the catch. He's not an elite after the catch player. This is what they wanted Amari Rodgers to be. And he couldn't be because he was not athletic enough. Jaden Reed, I think, is athletic enough. And this is what I this is where I landed with him. You have to have a plan for Reed. He's going to be a slot-only player in the NFL. He doesn't have that in and out twitch a lot of slot receivers has, but he can get open underneath on single break routes. And Michigan State didn't ask him to go beat man coverage with his route running. At the Senior Bowl, he showed much more as a route runner than he showed on tape, which is good and bad because it makes you wonder why he didn't do it more in college. One-on-ones at the Senior Bowl can be BS. Denzel Mims proved that. As a jet orbit gadget player, he definitely has juice. And for a smaller player, his body control and contested catch abilities say he doesn't have to be wide open to be open. It's nice to have a guy like that who also has some punt return ability. I had a third round grade on Jaden Reed. So at 50, I didn't love it. They traded back multiple times. They got, they got some more day three draft capital. They can use that to move back up to get some more players. From pure value, I don't love the pick, but I understand that there are a lot of people out there who think he's a really good player. And those two metrics, dominator and breakout age, really good. I like that. I like that other people that I think are smart about the league and and are good at player evaluation like him. I have almost exclusively liked Packers receiver picks Going back years, I love James Jones. I love Jordy Nelson. I wanted Deshaun Jackson, but that's a different thing. I I love Devontae Adams. I love these picks. And Greg, you know, did, did I watch Greg Jennings way back in the day? Probably not. But Randall Cobb, love that pick. I love the Ty Montgomery pick. So, and I, I love the Christian Watson pick. So I'm open to being wrong on this, obviously. I just, I, the, I didn't love the value, but the fit, the fit makes sense. In three receiver sets, Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs on the outside and Jaden Reed in the slot, that makes sense. You can run your jet motion plays. You can run your, your end of rounds, your orbit motions, little gadget receiver screens and, and tunnels and all kinds of interesting things. That's what this draft is. That's what this draft is all about. I'll talk about that in a second. Before we do, today's episode brought to you by our friends at Built Bar. Had one today. Had the coconut puff today. They're so, so, so good. Covered in 100% real dark chocolate with amazing flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, cookies and cream. Waiting on my cookies and cream puffs. My peanut butter puffs, which oh, I can't wait for. 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar. A lot of people think I'm just stumped for these because I, I have to. Love them. Ask anyone who knows me. I love these things. I am a built bar evangelist. I bring them home to my family at the holidays, not as presents, but I say I put them in stockings. I did. I did put them in stockings this year. So, uh, I, this is, this is real for me. It's real for me. Dang it. And you can go to built.com, get the specialty flavors, or you can head to Walmart. You can head to Sam's club, your big box store and grab a box. And, you know, tell me, tell me what you think. Tell me what you think. I think you're going to like them though. The totality of this draft, I think signals something about how the Packers want to play. And I don't want to fall down the rabbit hole of adjudicating, did Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur get along? And did they did they play the way that um, Matt LaFleur wanted them to play? Now, with Jordan Love, clearly they want to play a certain way. And I don't think it's a coincidence, by the way, that in the 2020 draft, they drafted Josiah DeGuar, they drafted A.J. Dillon, and then that year, they did their most under center in the Matt LaFleur era. They did their most play action in the Matt LaFleur era. That Josiah DeGuar was a big part of that early offense, um, especially against Minnesota, getting targets, getting playing time right away. I don't think that was a coincidence. And that now, Aaron Rodgers is a Jet. Jordan Love is going to be the quarterback. And they go out and they, they draft two tight ends. They draft a slot receiver. Attack the middle of the field. Run the ball from under center. Play action. This is going to move 
on the spectrum, on the continuum of Shanahan genre coaches. Shanahan, McVay, Zach Taylor. Um, there's a million of them right now. Kevin O'Connell, Matt LaFleur, of course. Um, Kevin Stefanski, Mike McDaniel. On the spectrum, I think Sean McVay leans the most into modern spread. We're going to go three receivers, four receivers, shotgun, and, and go. Whereas Kyle, under center, play action, run it 40 times if we want to. Really interesting run designs, heavy personnel, 21 personnel, 12 personnel, 13 personnel. Throw it to Kyle Juszczyk on a fullback wheel route. Um, hand it to George Kittle on a wide jet. All that kind of stuff. I think you're going to see the continuum of this Packers offense change. And I don't know if that's good or bad. I really don't. Because I don't know what's best for Jordan Love. Jordan Love at Utah State played in a spread sort of like empty most of the time kind of offense. Now he's been playing in this version, which maybe is like a nice way to just ease your ease yourself into going full Shanahan. There's certainly going to be times when it's third and nine and you can't just under center play action. You have to spread people out. You have to be able to attack down the field. You have to be able to make reads. You have to be able to understand, okay, the blitz is coming from here and you make your, your checks, your hot routes, set the protections and, and read the defense and make a throw on third down. Someone's going to have to get open on third down. Who is that guy going to be this year? Can it be Christian Watson consistently last year? A lot of Alan Lazard, Randall Cobb at times, but Christian Watson by the end of the season became that guy. They were going to him on fourth down. Multiple big fourth down conversions in that run at the end of the year when they started winning games. Can he take the next step? Can he be the Debo Samuel of the offense? Can Romeo Dobbs become the Brandon Ayuk of the offense? Can you get one of these tight ends to pop? Can you get Josiah DeGuar to grow into his role as the Kyle Juszczyk, the H-back? Go earn a second contract, big fella. And then you've got your running backs. Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, come downhill. There are still some running backs I really like on the board. Day three, I think they draft one because I think A.J. Dillon might be his last year. Aaron Jones extended, um, you know, made some changes to his contract, took the pay cut. So I am, I am so excited to see what this offense looks like because I think it is going to look so much more. And we saw it, it a bit in the Chiefs game until they felt like they had to pass to get back in the game. Under center play action. And I've, I've mentioned this a couple times. Just as Mosqueda put out a clip of all of Jordan Love's throws from last year. It is amazing how many of them are in the middle of the field. It is amazing how many of them are to the tight ends. Like I, I swear 85% of Josiah DeGuar's production as an NFL player have come from Jordan Love. And DeGuara was in the Rogers doghouse. He was in the doghouse. We know this. So without Aaron Rodgers, can he come in and be a bigger part of this offense? Do they set out to make him a bigger part of this offense? I thought he really settled in nicely to the version of the player that he became at the end of last year. H-back, sniffer, um, come in and lead block on plays, play essentially um, fullback at times, and then occasionally get your little you know, sit routes and stick. And, you know, he's not going to be out there running sail and, and deep corner routes and stuff like that. He's just not going to do that. But that's okay because now you have Luke Musgrave to do that. Now you have Tucker Craft to do that. Big bodied guys to go post up. And that is that is something else that stands out to me here. I don't think Jordan Love accuracy is a big issue, but for a young quarterback, what you love to have is big targets or guys that can make catches outside their frame where you don't have to put it right on them for them to make a play. Jaden Reed, not a big guy, but contested catches. He's so good at them. The body control is so good. And then Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave are 6'5", 250. They're going to be able to post up, play some basketball, go up and get the rebound. And in the red zone, like did, did the Packers just fix their red zone woes with two picks? Maybe they did. So I, I think that, you know, we, 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 thought there was a philosophical shift coming in 2020. We actually saw it 
more than I think we realized in the moment. Because then we saw the regression of it. 2021, 2022, it got further and further from that. And you start to go, oh, wait, that offense in 2020 actually looked a lot like the way we thought this offense was going to look coming in, or at least much closer to that. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. Yes, it is. I, I mentioned at the top of the show, um, our, our technical difficulties with the uh, live show audio in your podcast feed. Please go check that out. Um, our, our reactions, there should be two other clips. There's the Lucas Van Ness clip. And then there is the day two clip. Those are from our live reaction shows, but we have the full episode from our Thursday live show in your podcast feed. And this is the full episode from the Friday night show in your podcast feed. If you're watching on YouTube, you can ignore all of these prompts because that's where we are. Um, we will not have a live show Saturday, but we will have a show back in your feed on Monday, recapping everything here. I've already reached out to some people to talk about what's going on with these rookie orientation series. I have Eddie McGilvra, the Lucas Van Ness defensive line coach, his personal coach, um, set to come on the show. Our Michigan State host, um, Locked On Spartans, is going to come on and talk about Jaden Reed. So a ton of great stuff coming up to dig into these players. Now we have weeks, months, Seemingly years to talk about all of them. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live, like we are right now on YouTube, you can do that. Go subscribe to us on YouTube so you can stay Locked on Packers.